The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Jack Beecham. I'm a professor of chemistry here at uh, Caltech, and I have the honor of introducing uh, tonight's uh, speaker. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, Ernest Watson uh, lecture series and uh, begin by drawing your attention to the uh, program uh, brochure uh, for the next lecture, which will be on January the 26th in 2011. Uh, Charles Plott, who is the <coughs> Edward Hawkness Professor of Economics and Political Science, will talk on the design of information aggregation mechanisms, collecting and using the wisdom of crowds. And to learn more about that, if you don't have the brochure, you can pick it up uh, by the door as you leave and uh, read the uh, abstract. Uh, tonight's speaker, um, I've known for uh, many and admired for, for many years, uh, James uh, Heath. Uh, Jim received his Bachelor of Science degree from uh, Baylor University and then received his PhD in chemistry from Rice University. He was a Miller Fellow at uh, UC Berkeley and then served on the technical staff at IBM Watson Laboratories. In 1994, he joined the faculty at uh, UCLA where he was a professor of chemistry uh, and founded the California Nanosystems Institute in 2000, serving as its director until he moved uh, to uh, Caltech. Uh, <clears throat> Jim's uh, work at UCLA uh, was involved primarily with the design of nano uh, computers, and it's a dream which is still being uh, pursued um, in many uh, laboratories. Uh, and he was very fundamental in developing some of the early uh, tools and elements of circuits that you would use in a, in a, um, in a nano-sized uh, computer there. Uh, currently, Jim is the Elizabeth Gillen Professor uh, of Chemistry at uh, Caltech, and he also serves as the Professor of, Medi of Molecular Medical Pharmacology in the UCLA Health Sciences uh, Center. He's received many awards uh, during his uh, career. Uh, one that doesn't come often to scientists, he was selected <clears throat> as the Forbes list of seven top innovators in the world last year, 2009. The Forbes list is, uh, is an interesting one because uh, it's, it's, not given, it's not given just for being smart or having done something clever uh, in the past. You have to be actively uh, applying your ideas and changing the way uh, the world operates and the world uh, and the world uh, thinks there. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, list this year actually included the head of uh, WikiLeaks, uh, for example. <clears throat> uh, he's been involved in the founding of uh, numerous uh, companies at uh, present, and I think you'll hear about some of the work of these uh, of these companies tonight. He's the founder and serves on the board of Integrated uh, Diagnostics and also uh, Momentum uh, Biosciences. There. In terms of his uh, scientific uh, contributions, uh, Jim has published uh, over 200 papers. Now, I'm not going to list those uh, for you uh, tonight. He also has, uh, holds a uh, title to several uh, dozen uh, important uh, uh, patents ranging everywhere from uh, molecular-based uh, computers uh, to uh, work you'll hear about uh, tonight having to do with uh, cancer diagnostics and, uh, and therapy. Uh, he's one of the most highly cited uh, chemists uh, today based on the number of references to his uh, published uh, work. The most highly cited, though, was his second paper uh, of his career as a uh, graduate student. Uh, it was a paper that was published in Nature in 1985. Title of the uh, paper is simply C60, Buckminster Fullerene. This was the paper that really 
started uh, the, the nanotechnology uh, revolution. Uh, it was the discovery that you could take 60 carbon atoms and assemble them into a molecular sized soccer ball. Um, the unfortunate thing perhaps for Jim is that there were five authors on the paper. Uh, he was, as George Bush would say, the boots on the ground, he did, he did the work, uh, but three of the other authors received uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for that work in 1996. But let me assure you, I have, I have no doubt uh, that there remains uh, a Nobel Prize uh, in, his, uh, in his future there. Uh, he was interviewed by uh, Science Watch uh, correspondent Gary Tobbs a, a few years ago. And Gary asked him the question, you've been described by Harry Croto, was one of the, he was the lead author on the uh, Nature uh, paper, uh, as having green fingers, an almost uncanny ability to get experiments to work. Uh, what does that take? Jim's answer is, and this I think describes him completely, I don't know. I just have much more success getting science to work than the average person. People have skills, right? <laughs> And there's some stuff I'm not very good at. I'm not very good at theory. That's actually not right. He's very good at theory. He's just modest. But when it comes to doing really hard experiments on things that people care about, I'm good at making the experiment work. It's a kind of intuition. But he does indeed have um, magic fingers. Now, there are some perhaps younger people here in the audience that are interested in, in science careers in the future and would like to uh, to read further about uh, the work that's described tonight. Uh, in the January 2009 Scientific American, uh, Jim Heath, Mark Davis, and Leroy Hood published a paper entitled Nanoscale Technologies Can Transform How Disease is Understood, Attacked, and Possibly uh, Prevented. So I would suggest if you want some further reading related to tonight's lecture that you look in the January 2009 issue of, of Scientific American. Very well written uh, and well illustrated article. Uh, at this point, let me uh, introduce uh, James Heath for the Watson lecture tonight. The title of his lecture is Personalized Medicine, Molecular Diagnostics, and Cancer. Sometimes when you get such a nice introduction from a colleague, you, s you wish your mother were in the audience. <laughs> and she is tonight. My mother is in the audience. So thank you for coming. And tonight I want to talk to you about, um, I think, a, a, word, a term or a phrase that's a buzzword in many um, newspaper articles or popular science, the, the, the issue of personalized medicine. And I want to talk about some of the really serious challenges, but also the potentials uh, that await us. And I'm going to lead by talking about um, therapeutics, because it turns out in the whole field of biotechnology, you can think of it like a totem pole. And at the top of that is a drug that's in the phase two or phase three trial. And at the bottom is a diagnostic. And that world is changing, but still the drugs lead it. Okay, so if we want to look to the future, we want to understand what's going on now, and what's going on in the next 10, 15 years, look to the drugs. And, um, and oftentimes, when people talk about personalized medicine, um, you'll hear a term called P4 medicine, which is, means it's personalized, but it also has other Ps. It has preventative, so that if you think about most medicine now, especially cancer, it's very reactive. We don't do preventative medicine for cancer by and large, um, but it's also participatory. Patients taking an, uh, an active role in their own health care. And finally, it's um, predictive. And um, that's the nature of many of the molecular diagnostics I'll talk about. So, drugs. If we look at cancer about 15, 10, 15 years ago, pretty much the only thing that was available in terms of drugs were things like cisplat. And um, I don't know, it's, I guess it's a little bit off on the edge. We can, well, it's just off, okay. Um, so it's just a, it's a very simple molecule like this. It's got two chlorines on one side, two amines on the other, and a platinum in the middle. And it just targets fast-growing cells, meaning that it 
it pretty much kills anything that's growing, but it kills the fastest growing ones the quickest. And that's why you have hair loss. It's, these are toxins. And, um, and there's a lot of technologies, in fact, nanotechnologies, and one of the leaders is here, Mark Davis at Caltech, um, that are working towards um, taking these types of toxic therapies and making them much less toxic while not losing their um, efficacy. But about um, a, a dozen years ago, and now they're basically frontline therapies, a new set of therapies began to emerge for cancer. And these therapies are no longer targeted at just a generic cell growth. They're targeted at the molecular lesions that are responsible for the disease. And so this is one. This was the first one, in fact. It's called Gleevec. It's targeted at what's called a receptor tyrosine kinase, which is an enzyme that basically is turned on all the time in a cancer cell. And this will shut it off. And then there is um, a, a biotechnology product, such as what Amgen produces or, or Genentech. These are um, antibodies. And these are generally targeted at um, receptor proteins on cell surfaces, um, uh, proteins that might receive signals. And because of those signals, they exhibit aberrant behavior, or at some of the signaling proteins themselves that swim between cells. These do not go into cells. Typically, they're on the outside. And if we look into the future, in about 10 or 15 years, things that are just beginning to enter clinical trials now, or have been in there for just a couple of years, um, you've got um, genetic engineering of the patient's immune system, which I will talk about quite a bit. I think this is a tremendously exciting a concept for cancer because your immune system is probably the most powerful um, um, a therapeutic you have. It just doesn't always work right. And then you've got what are called siRNAs that actually target right into the genetic defects that code for the cancerous behavior and silence them. And in fact, the first human trial of uh, uh, one of the first human trials of an siRNA also was launched out of Caltech and UCLA just a couple of years ago. OK, so what's happened during the course of this evolution of drugs is that the drugs have become more and more selective, which is good because they don't have the kind of toxic side effects that one associates with chemotherapies. But as a consequence of that selectivity, they affect smaller and smaller fractions of the patient population. And, um, and it turns out Finding who are going to be the responders from the non-responders is a huge challenge. And in fact, it's not always, given current technologies, possible to do that. And you might have responders that are, you know, 25% would be good. 10% might be typical. And it turns out, also, these drugs are typically used now in conjunction with chemotherapy. So we haven't gained that much. Um, but the response rate from just these drugs alone is oftentimes rather marginal. You may get quality of life, but you may get it for six months or three months. And so you have to run very, very long clinical trials to detect not only the increase in lifespan, but um, to differentiate the responders from all the patients that are participating in the trial. And it's a really expensive proposition. And most companies won't fund such trials. And if they do fund such trials, and they end up with a drug like this uh, drug here, this antibody on this previous slide, Avastin, which is now a $5 billion drug, um, that um, you know, if for, I'll talk about glioblastoma patients. But the glioblastoma patients get two or three months of quality of life if they respond on average. And it costs them $100,000 for that. And that's like your kid's college education. I know. I have a kid in college. Out the window for um, a roll of the dice in a few months. And on top of that, it provides a rationale for expensive diagnostics. Because you can say, well, if I can tell if a patient is going to not have to pay for a $100,000 drug, then I can have a $5,000 diagnostic. And so it sends the whole healthcare picture in the wrong direction. Okay? And so if we talk about personalized medicine, you know, this type of trend is going to kill it dead in its tracks. OK, so let's talk about um, the issue of how do you tell if a drug is working 
or how do you stratify a patient to know if that patient will respond or not? And, um, and so you can't look to traditional biology for that. This is basically a, a picture of how we typically think of cancers. If you, uh, you know, God forbid, are diagnosed with cancer, they will take a biopsy and a pathologist will look at the tissue. And this is a picture, this is a textbook example, so this is really a, a terrific example of a carcinoma. 80% of all cancers are carcinomas. And this is actually a cervical cancer. And, it, and the way it works is that you, it starts up here in these what are called epithelial cells that look like brick wall. They look very, very regular. When you get cancer, those epithelial cells don't really do much except for they become irregular looking. And, um, but at some point, they get signals, molecular signals from their environment, and now they do completely new things. Um, they, they begin uh, invading the surrounding tissue, and they become mobile. So this is something that a cervix doesn't necessarily have involved in, it, in its function, but, um, but when it's cancerous and it gets these signals, it becomes um, a basically a fundamentally different beast. And it, it'll invade the surrounding tissue and eventually get into the bloodstream and cause um, uh, uh, metastases. And if you, um, a pathologist will look at a slide like this, and generally they're not, this is a textbook example, so they're not nearly this good, but they'll give you a grade one or grade two or grade three or such a, such a diagnosis. And then the therapy is more or less decided upon, uh, it's a radiation or chemotherapy typically decided upon that type of a, of a stage, staging, stage one or stage two. Okay, so the molecular picture of cancer is quite a bit different. In the molecular picture, um, you have a cell and, um, and at the core of the cell, and this is something unique to biology, biology has at its core an instruction set, which is the genome. And the genome, you can have a genetic defect, maybe one you're born with or one that you acquire um, uh, throughout your life. And this can, uh, will build what's called an uh, mRNA that will in turn build a protein. And the protein can be defective in a way that basically it short circuits the normal behavior of the cell. And, and, and cancer, for example, will turn the cell on all the time. That's why cancer cells replicate a lot. And there's lots and lots of different ways that you can short circuit this, this cell. And so the challenge is how do, you, uh, you know, how do you read out these molecular messages to try to understand what is the molecular nature of this patient's cancer and how do we treat it? Are they going to respond to therapy or are they not? Um, and so if we look at this, you know, one begins now, instead of it's this, this traditional descriptive picture of biology, you get biology as an information science. And so uh, this is just a, a, a picture by analogy, but you know, DNA is the software um, instructions. Um, when you um, uh, 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 hit a, a keystroke, um, basically, you're asking certain of these genes to, um, to build mRNAs, and so the mRNA levels, which is a, a sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence, um, tell which genes have been asked to execute their instructions. And the protein levels um, are actually the machines that execute the instructions. And, um, and so one would think, well, gosh, if we you know, know enough about cancer, then we can set up a, uh, say, a, a, a bunch of molecular measurements uh, based upon a signaling pathway. So this is a, a signaling pathway. It's, it's common to many cancers. This is uh, specifically for um, glioblastoma, brain cancer, but it also is very similar to what you see in ovarian cancer and other diseases. Um, and um, you measure certain aspects of, this, of this, the molecules in this pathway. You set up a decision tree, and then you can say, well, this patient based upon this decision tree should go on this drug, this patient should go on this drug, and this patient should go on this drug. And in principle, that seems great. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work. And the examples I just showed you are basically anecdotal. And um, you know, as a, this is, a, I should tell you that this is a field where you do not need motivation. Um, you know, this is a good friend of mine who was involved in our molecular computing work who just uh, two days ago passed away from brain cancer, and it was a, a, very, a very unpleasant um, uh, death. Um, but th the reason why it doesn't work is that we simply don't know enough biology yet. And so these pictures that we have of these signaling networks are horribly incomplete. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the biological information. <clears throat> 
Okay, so. Not all information is the same. So here's two books that they weigh roughly the same amount. <laughs> and they, um, but, but clearly, Scoundrel's Captive is not the information-rich tome, possibly, that Newton's Principia is. And that's the same case in biology. So let me give you an example. At the genomic level, so this is DNA. So the, a couple of years ago, the National Cancer Institute started the um, uh, Cancer Genome Atlas Project. And they took this same cancer I just talked about, glioblastoma. This is what Teddy Kennedy died of and what my friend died of. And they, um, and they took uh, a very deep, so they sequenced the full genomes of many of these glioblastoma tumors. And, and what you're looking at are three of these different signaling pathways. Glioblastoma is a very, very heterogeneous disease. It has uh, three known aberrant signaling pathways. Wherever you see off colors or percentage numbers or whatever, these are, are things that happen that are not good and uh, that, that are indicative of the cancer in these patients. Um, and there's actually so much data in this Cancer Genome Atlas that the National Cancer Institute, which has a really big computational infrastructure, had to double their memory banks just to store it. And, um, and yet, and I think this information will, in the end, be an incredibly valuable roadmap. But at the moment, if you ask of all these terabytes of information, is there one piece that we can use right now to help stratify a patient for responding to a therapy? The answer is no. It has some predictive character, but not in this case. So if we look at the quality, well, the genome is going to have some predictive capacity. That's for sure. And, it's, and our knowledge of the genome is maturing. But at the moment, except for maybe uh, Down syndrome predictions or things like that that, we, that we've heard about, um, the predictive capacity is relatively weak. But it's really, really cheap to do genome sequencing. We talk about the $1,000 genome. And that's actually going to happen real soon. It's only now about $10,000 to get your genome sequenced. And, um, and so a little bit of cancer diagnostics and using genomics to do cancer diagnostics is kind of like looking under the street lamp for your keys when you drop them, because you have a street lamp, not because that's where the keys are. Um, mRNAs are actually pretty noisy. They're about a dollar a piece or so. Um, there's some information, but there's lots of noise. And the issue is that even if you make an MRI, it doesn't mean that you're going to make the protein. So these just, there's a lot of regulatory biology that, that happens that controls these levels. So this is not a particularly, um, there are some tests out there, um, but uh, genomic health has one. But in general, these are not the most information rich. Proteins are, in fact, by far the most information rich, but they cost 50 bucks to measure one protein. And that's the cost of the hospital. And that price point has not changed in about 20 or 30 years, even as these have dropped dramatically. And so I'm going to focus on proteins, because that's sort of you know, looking for the keys where the keys are. Um, and so we have a technology goal in our group of how, what can we do to drop protein measurements down to a penny a piece? So if you can do that, and you can do them with high accuracy, then you can change the world. And, um, but it has a, a huge amount of technology challenges. But I want to give you a couple of examples of what can happen if you can make protein measurements cheap. And you know we have actually done quite a bit to make them cheap. It lets us at least do some of these exploratory examples. And I'll talk about patients um, involved in this. And I will talk about uh, one class of drugs from the present, um, these antibodies. I'll talk about Avastin in particular. And I'll talk about this um, uh, engineered immune system. And it turns out. Um, in this case, this is an interesting one. I've talked about diagnostics are at the bottom and therapeutics at the top. But in this case, the diagnostics actually define the therapy. So it's a really, it's almost like the two things flip. OK. And they also illustrate a really interesting thing of cancer biology that I'm not going to go into, but I think it's worth thinking about. So normally, one thinks of your immune system as what you use to combat disease. And in fact, for um, uh, for these uh, engineered um, vaccines uh, against cancer, that's exactly what the immune system is. Um, but it turns out when these epithelial cells start invading surrounding tissue, these green things here are immune cells. 
And those immune cells are what are sending the signals that are causing the tissue, causing the cancer to invade. So a lot of the bad things that cancer does, it actually gets from its microenvironment. We're going to use that. Um, but it gets from its microenvironment. And the microenvironment, you can think of a, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a tumor as a wound that doesn't heal. And so there's a lot of inflammation. Uh, and that inflammation uh, uh, promotes the uh, carcinogenesis. OK, so Avastin. So cancer does only a few things. It invades tissues. It grows without independent of cell signaling. Um, uh, it also needs to feed itself because it's growing quickly. And it does that by growing blood vessels in a process called angiogenesis. Um, and, and, and this the VEGF is a protein that is actually a signaling protein in the tumor microenvironment that called vascular endothelial growth factor. The vascular is blood vessels. And um, it sends signals to promote um, the growth of, of blood vessels. And so Avastin is simply an antibody that ties up the VEGF and stops it from working. OK, so Avastin is from Genentech. Um, uh, it's a frontline therapy for many cancers now, including glioblastoma and ovarian. But also, um, it's also used uh, for um, an eye. It actually works really well for a particular eye, eye disease. Um, for the um, patients that get it, it helps about 30% of them. The help is marginal, a few months. For that few months, um, if, if it is just a few months, it's about 100K. If it's a whole year, you'll spend 400K. Uh, there is no diagnostic guidance for predicting Avastin responders. OK, and so, um, so we looked into this microenvironment with our colleagues at uh, UCLA, um, uh, Tim Clousey, who's a, a neuro-oncologist, and Paul Michel, who's, a, who's a, a pathologist. And we identified 50-some proteins that were associated with this microenvironment. And the idea is that if you're shutting down the tumor, you're going to shut down the microenvironment. And that ought to provide you some insight into whether the drug's working or not. And it should, it should give you some rapid insight. So if you want to know which of these 50 proteins, we just, we just know that there's 50 or so that are relevant. There's probably a, much more than that, but these are the ones we found through the literature that had antibodies. Um, you want to ask which ones? Well, we don't know. And so you have to measure all of them. And you've got to do them on a lot of patients. And at 50 bucks per protein, that's $1.25 million just to find out which ones of these are, are relevant. And we looked. We didn't have it. And so you need to find a, 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 a cheaper way to do, uh, to do this. And so let me talk about why blood protein measurements are so expensive um, and, why, um, and why we actually look in the blood. So it turns out this microenvironment is constantly bathed every few minutes by blood that circulates through your entire body. And, um, and so the, the, the microenvironment, wherever it is in the body, you can sample it by sampling the blood. And so, um, so the blood is, the, is a really powerful window. It's the most complete version of the human proteome. Um, and, and it's just sampling everything all the time. And so if you look at how typical blood measurements are done, they're typically done, you can think, you think of maybe you get PSA measured, a CA125 for ovarian cancer recurrence or what have you. Um, and the way they do it is that they'll take about 10 milliliters of blood. And, and so that's cost. That's a lot of cost to the patient. Um, centrifuge to separate the plasma from the, from the cells, such as this. That's uh, 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 some labor intensity. Uh, measure the proteins in the 96 well plate. It's very slow. Um, if you really run to take this blood and then you run to the, and, and, and do the assay, it still takes a few hours. And more often than not, the laboratory and the clinic are in different locations and it takes a few days to get your results back. It has a lot of human intervention, not comfortable for the patient. It doesn't scale to lots of proteins. It lets you do a couple. And, um, and then it has uh, sensitivity and dynamic range issues, which, um, um, uh, but still, even without that, it, it, it's an awkward approach. And there's also hidden costs. And here's a really interesting hidden cost. So these new therapeutics that are coming along, they don't, you know, if, if you're given, if, you, if you're a cancer patient, you go on chemotherapy or radiation, you'll go back for maybe a CT scan 10 weeks after you start, and they'll look and see if your tumor has shrunk. OK? And it turns out these drugs work really fast. So here's a patient who's responding to one of those small molecule enzyme inhibitors, Gleevec. It's got this horrible burden of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. You're looking at a PET scan here. And within 24 hours of getting the drug, these tumors are shutting down. It's a staggering response. And, um, and you know, pretty soon, it's a fairly normal scan. 
And um, it doesn't mean that the tumors are gone. It just means that their metabolism is shut down. The drug is working, OK? And so we don't do any diagnostics on that type of time scale. And yet, that's the, how the kinetics of the drug are working. And if you're going to be taking 10 milliliters of, of, of blood from a patient, you're not going to do it on, on, a, on, a, on a high frequency basis. In addition, the blood proteins are unstable once they're removed from the body. And, um, and so the longer you wait before you measure the levels of the blood proteins, the less accurate your measurements. OK. So uh, we've been working on trying to do this really cheaply for a while. And I gave, um, and we had come up with a pretty good technology, but it wasn't simple enough. And, um, and so I asked my postdoc, June, I said, this is what we want you to do. I want you to measure, like, you know, 50 proteins for the price of one. You've got to get state-of-the-art sensitivity and accuracy. You're only going to get a pinprick of blood. And because, you know, no one minds giving a pinprick. So if you want to sample somebody daily or a couple times a day, that's not a big deal. Um, you don't get electricity or plumbing, um, because we actually need to go to people's houses to, to do this. Because it's, you know, we doctors don't pay house calls, but Caltech students do. <laughs> um, and then you want to have the measurements completed, actually have the protein levels recorded within, say, 10 minutes of taking the blood, but have the measurements repeated within 30 or 45 minutes. And then finally, we want this disgruntled high school, we want it to be so simple that this disgruntled high school student can actually do it, OK? And so June, so June's going to actually do this test on me um, while I describe how this thing works. It's really, uh, and then I'm going to pass, pass around a couple of these chips so you can see. And, and you're going to be, you're going to look at these and you're say, is that it? Is that, and really, that's it. They're, they're that simple. And that's the point. Just, pass, just you can look at it and pass it around. OK, so. What this thing does is we have, remember, we have to take whole blood. We get a pinprick of it. And he's about to take my pinprick. And, um, and you've got to separate the plasma from the cells if you, wanna, um, if you want to. Um, uh, 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 otherwise, you can't measure the proteins. And so here's the whole blood coming in. And it's focused on this little tiny neck. And then it expands into this channel here. But the blood cells are focused into the center of the channel just the center of the flowing stream. And, um, and, and the assays are done on the surface. So we actually just spatially separate the cells from the blood. And then we do the assays using this uh, very clever barred code technology that was developed by uh, some other folks in my group. And the whole thing is powered by these two pieces of filter paper here. And it sequentially empties each one of these little chambers so that when 40 minutes are done, you have the whole protein panel assayed. And, uh, and each of these barcodes is a measurement of that panel. And, um, and I'm not going to say much about this technology, but you know, this antibody barcode is a really critical technology piece that we'll um, uh, use in, uh, throughout this talk. And now I've got to do like, um, like Julia Child, because this is a pretty fast measurement, but it's not that fast. And so we've got to pull the fish out of the oven, even though we just showed you the raw fish. Okay. So this is, um, this is basically what more, I don't know what my proteins are going to look like, but this is a protein from a, from a healthy donor uh, measured in one, of these, in one of these assays. You see these barcodes. In this case, we measured just 12 proteins, uh, but we did it um, uh, it's eight times that's recorded. And you can see that the, uh, uh, each of these uh, looks practically identical. So the reproducibility is extremely high. And it turns out it's very high from chip to chip. And, um, and this doesn't come easily. So this, chip that's being passed around looks very low tech, but it's not. It turns out there's a fair amount of technology involved in getting this, this, these, uh, 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 these assays to work at this level. And in fact, this is better than what would be a clinical gold standard. OK. Um, and then finally, because um, uh, as we uh, move into taking this into the clinic, we need a lot of these, and we need them to be highly reproducible. Um, we've uh, developed robotics in our own lab um, that, will, um, that will construct these um, uh, barcodes and then allows us to just rapidly assemble the chips. This is one that does um, 18 of these chips uh, with about an hour worth of manual labor. And that, that's competitive with pretty much uh, standard molecular um, uh, printing techniques that are used for, for uh, other technologies. But these barcodes are actually very, very small. And you'll see why that's a big benefit in a little bit. Okay.
So now we go to patients, and we didn't use this technology, we used pieces of this technology. This is a constantly evolving story, but chunks of it to do this. So now we're gonna ask glioblastoma, brain cancer patients, are they responders or not responders to this drug? And, um, and so this is a, the chart on the left is, a, 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 is just a bunch of the patients, uh, just a sample of the patients and the kind of data you get. Uh, here now you can see we've actually measured many proteins on the order of uh, 40 or so, and you see that the patients have these different, different levels associated with their, their proteins. Okay, so this is not like when you measure PSA, is your level rising or not? It's a very different type of diagnostic test. So the way, and, and it turns out you can't really process it by eye. It's a lot of computation. So imagine we've measured three proteins and five patients. Then, uh, and so we have patients that have these different levels. Then we will use a computer program to regroup these so that the patients that have the most similar looking protein profiles are closest together and the very different ones are far apart. So 302 is close to 201 and very far apart from 010, okay? And if we've measured the right proteins, then this type of grouping will actually stratify the responders from the non-responders, okay? I haven't showed you that yet, but if we measure the right proteins, it does. And then we take an unknown patient, and then we fit, well, where do they most, who do they most look like on this, on this plot? And then it's just guilt by association. Okay? <laughs> and then we take this test, we optimize for, of all these proteins, some have value, some don't. We don't know which ones, that's part of the point. Um, and we just optimize a diagnostic test. So there's actually a lot of statistical statistics that goes into this thing, but here's the result. So each one of these columns here, or each one of these rows here, is an individual patient. The red color is indicative of their protein levels, and then each, um, uh, 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 each column is an individual protein. And, and you can see we actually did pretty well through this approach, because the green ones are the responders, they're down here, the red ones are the non-responders, the clinical gold standard, which is the CT scan, is not particularly, uh, is not 100% uh, accurate. And so there's some unknown ones here, which are these uh, blue, uh, 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 the other color ones. But if we take this optimized assay, um, and then we say, well, who's um, uh, responding to the drug, which would be um, no growth, and who's non-responding, um, then we actually do really well. I mean, look at this. We, we are better than 95%, or are better than 90% in both positive and negative predictive value. And that's any diagnostic test, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good um, result. Um, and, but it turns out that you actually need about 12 of the proteins from this panel, eight to 12, to answer this, this question. And you, know, you can actually ask many questions of this data. You can ask, how old is the patient? There's easier ways to do that. But you can ask that, and you can actually get some of an, a bit of an answer out. You can ask cancer versus healthy, um, uh, 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 tumor progression versus stable, or responders versus non-responders. And, um, and each of those, you need roughly 8 to 12 proteins. Some of them overlap. Some of them are, don't overlap. Um, and, um, but, uh, but with about 20 proteins, you can actually answer a few clinical questions that benefit patients. Okay, and I'll point out that at this stage, knowing the entire genome sequence of each one of those patients would not help us with the information that we get from eight to 12 proteins measured this way. And so, I should say, so what, so what do we do now? So what we're doing now is that we have a reasonable test. Now we're going in at, the, at day, day zero before they start, and then every day, that's why we're making house, begin to make house calls, every day going and measuring these levels so that we'll, we hopefully will know within a few days if the drug is working or not because that's the kinetics of the drug. And if they started that drug, then just stop them and put them on something else if it's not working. And so you don't spend that $100,000. It's not as good as predicting ahead of time, but the difference is a couple of days. Okay, so now let's go to this, this uh, type of therapy right here. So this is, is this will feel like the future, and it is. Okay, so this is a picture of a virus particle. And this virus particle molecularly looks different from the rest of your body. Okay, and because it looks different at the molecular scale, your immune system will recognize those differences and it will make um, uh, 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 antibodies and T cells that are designed specifically to remove this virus particle. 
Once you've taught your immune cell system about this, then um, uh, the virus won't infect you again, and you're immune. And um, there are exceptions like HIV. I'm not going to talk about those. But in general, this is how immunity works. It's why you don't get the same cold twice. And in a similar way, a cancer cell can look different from other cells in your body. OK? And um, uh, the, the, the challenge is that sometimes your immune system, even if your cancer cell looks different, the immune system says it still looks like you. And so you might get a non-existent or a weak response. Um, and, and so, uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly different beast. But nevertheless, there are molecular differences on these cells. And for adoptive T cell immunotherapy, you actually engineer T cells because the response is weak. You take them out of the body, genetically modify them so that they actually recognize specifically the tumor cells and put them back in. And when it works, you've engineered their immunity. They're immune. It's the only thing I know of except for early stage surgical resection of a tumor that is a palliative cure. Um, but getting it to work is incredibly tricky. And that's why it's still in the tri in trials. OK, so what does the immune system see? Well, it turns out that every cell in your body is always making proteins and getting rid of old ones. It chops them up. And, 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 it, and, and when it chops up the old proteins, it'll take pieces of them, and it will put them into pockets of what are called major histocompatibility complexes on the cell surfaces. And so the immune system comes around and samples these little peptides, these antigens that are in these pockets. And it, that's how it detects if it's you or it's not you or it's something that it should, it should attack. Um, and so if the immune system detects something that it should attack, then it'll kill the cell. The T cell will do that. So how do you, so what is different about tumors? Well, every tumor is going to be a little different. It turns out melanoma tumors have something that is not so much unlike you, but it's unlike you enough to use. And that's the fact that they're very heavily pigmented. And the proteins that are associated with this heavy pigmentation are just overexpressed in these tumors to a great abundance, and pieces of those proteins are stuck onto the, pro, onto the, onto the tumor surface. This is how, obviously how, how a pathologist or a dermatologist would diagnose melanoma, just by the color. And so you can design T cells uh, genetically that will recognize what's on the surface of these, uh, uh, that these, uh, these peptides associated with these pigmentation proteins and, um, and, and get them to attack the, the tumor cells. So it's not like, quite like attacking only cancer cells. But if you have an autoimmune dysfunction, it's one associated with skin pigmentation loss. It's not associated with... Um, a, a, deadly, a deadly response. And so the, the process is actually a very, very sophisticated process. And it has many, many people involved in it. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention a, a couple of those as we go. Um, but you extract T cells from a patient's blood that haven't committed to being any particular kind of um, a recognition capacity yet. And then you take a, a virus vector, a virus with, with a, 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 a genetic material in it, and you um, genetically modify these T cells so that you build in a T cell receptor gene that recognizes these pigmentation antigens. And then you grow up to about a billion. You suppress the patient's immune system. That's because you want to knock, this, you want to, you want to knock the immune system out of balance when you put all these, all these T cells back in the patient. And then you um, uh, put these uh, T cells back into the patient and let them do their work. And, um, and so here's a, a patient. And this is a picture like this makes you believe. This is an amazing response. So here's a patient. You can see this is a mel melanoma, for those of you who don't know. Um, uh, it obviously starts in the skin. But if it penetrates just a little bit distance into the skin, then the chance that it's metastasized is almost unity. And when it metastasizes, it metastasizes incredibly, it just, you get tumors all over the place. So here's a, here's a patient, and you can see this is a PET scan again. It's a little bleached out on this, on this uh, projector, but there's tumors everywhere. And after uh, this um, adoptive cell immunotherapy, you can, even these tumors here 
are actually going away. The brain is not a tumor. That's, that's just a, a lot of metabolic activity in the brain. But all these tumors are going away. This is just the, the, uh, the imaging probe, the PET probe, clearing through the, through the um, 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 uh, kidneys. Um, but 20 weeks later, what's going to happen? I don't know. This is the, uh, Tony Rivas who, at UCLA who, who, who does the, is the patient directing this trial. Um, the tumors may develop a therapy resistance. Uh, the therapy itself may lose effectiveness. And so what one needs to do during this process as a diagnostic measurement is to monitor the status of the immune system. And, um, and that's not an easy thing to do. That's why people can sell products like this. So this is the ultimate immune booster, which has got olive leaf, elderberry, and oregano extracts. And this also, I mean, I, it's not, you can't see the t thing, but this is also, I guess, the penultimate immune booster of pine bark, green tea, and grapeseed. How do you know if these things work? You have no idea if these things work. Monitoring the immune system is actually a very, very tough thing to do. But it's through the blood that you do it. OK. So and in, in particular, for this particular therapy, this is not your father's therapy. This is a drug that not only is targeting just the tumor or the, or the pigmentation-rich cells, it's targeting them, it's killing them, it's replicating, it's making more drug, it's recruiting other immune cells, and so it actually has a, a large number of functions associated with it, a very sophisticated, it's like a machine in your body. And all of the engineered T cells here are genetically identical, identical because we made them that way, and so DNA measurements are useless, um, but they can function very, very different. So that's the difference between proteins and, 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 and the genome. And thus we have to measure proteins in these cells if we want to understand their functional capacity. We do a lot of other stuff, too. We monitor, in fact, uh, uh, the students who do this. I'll, you'll see their pictures in a minute. A lot of blood proteins. I think it's like 60. Is that, is that how many you measured, Chow? I saw Chow here somewhere. 36. 36. 36. <laughs> and we also monitor a lot of um, uh, uh, a diversity of other populations of, of T cells. OK, so the whole thing is to put, this, uh, uh, put these um, uh, to get a movie of the immune system during this, during this therapy. And so here's an example of a patient that uh, had, in fact, a very large tumor burden. It's not quite as obvious here, but a very large tumor burden. Those tumors began to go away, but after a while, um, they, they, they began to come back. And so you know, the question is, basically, about a week after this therapy starts, the physicians are flying blind. And so do you need to repeat the therapy if you're going to modify this trial, customize it for this individual? Um, are our T cells still working correctly? Uh, do we need to administer different types of engineered T cells, et cetera? So that's what you hope to get out of, out of immune system monitoring. OK, so I told you that the T cells have all these functions. And uh, whether you know, it's attack the tumor, bind to the tumor, replicate, what have you, there's about 15 or so functions that are important. And if you've got a T cell that can do most of those functions, that's like Superman. And so when you are getting your immune system to attack your cancer, this is the guy you want. If it's doing like, I don't know, eight or nine functions, that's like Batman. Still pretty good. Batman kicked most people around. And if it's got like five functions, that's like Robin. It's marginal. It's better than having nobody on your side. And then there's a dysfunction. So that's what you're measuring when you measure these T cells. You're measuring these functions. And it turns out this is a really hard thing to do because, one, these T cells are actually pretty rare cells. So you have to capture them. They're antigen-specific T cells. Um, uh, you need to measure uh, each of these functions has associated with it one or two proteins. So you need to measure about 20 proteins or so for these functions. And it turns out you need to do it on each individual T cell you capture. You can't do it on the population. And let me describe why that's so. So let's say, again, this, this Gedanken experiment, where we measure three functions, one, two, A, B, C, and we got five T cells. And let's say that the first T cell does function A really well, but doesn't do these two, and so on and so forth. When we average up these responses, we find that all the functions are present. And we might believe that we have five Superman T cells, when in fact we have a Batman, three Robins, and a Homer Simpson. <laughs> okay? 
So unless you can resolve each individual T cell, you don't know the status of the immune system. And the way it's, the gold standard of this is a, is a technology that um, is not a, a, a casual technology. It's, a, it's called a flow cytometry. Um, and it doesn't really look at functional proteins. It actually looks at, at, it classifies cells by membrane proteins, more or less. Very occasionally, it'll look at a small number of functions. But this is the, the, the beast that, that is typically used. And when it was used on one of these patients um, uh, that was at, at a responding stage, but it was shortly before uh, uh, the, the patient began to be refractory to, to the therapy, um, um, it, it, uh, it, it, was, it classified the, the cells as what are called effector T cells. It didn't really look at any functions, um, but it said that there were 90% homogeneous effector T cells, basically. So you expect that the T cells are all pretty much the same. Okay, and so the technology we use is not this. It just is about the size of this. This is the picture I found on Google Image. Um, this is the picture of the, of the chip. So it, we use these barcodes again. Um, so on this little glass and plastic chip are about 1,050 or so little chambers. An individual T cell gets introduced into each one of these little chambers. Sometimes you get zero cells, sometimes two. But you have so many chambers that you can actually get a lot of T cells, single T cells. And, um, and here you just look at this as the quality of the data you get out. But here we have one cell, and you can see that one cell is right here. Here's two cells in the chamber. Here's one, two cells, another two cell experiment, a zero cell experiment. And, um, and then we measure the, the proteins. And the data, even though this is a relatively, uh, the data comes out looking something like this, OK? So the, the state of the art, I think this is actually 12 protein data, but the state of the art what we knew now is 20 proteins in these patients. And so this is a small piece of the data, but one cell was sitting in between these two green marks. And then these, uh, when you read off the barcode, you're reading out the amount of proteins that are present. And so this is what the data looks like when you put it up. Now each of these row, rows, instead of being a patient, is an individual single cell. Each of these columns is a protein. Uh, here's healthy patients. Here's the patient that was the melanoma patient on the trial. There's Ann and Chow over on the right. And this is what we found out. So these were nominally 90% homogeneous, but by functional performance, they were anything but homogeneous. In fact, we had to account for just the top 63%. There's some 40-some different um, uh, 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 functional types of cells here. Some of them, the ones here on the far left, are truly are Superman. And there's Batman over here. There's a lot of Robins. And there are a couple of Homer Simpsons, but not too many, it turns out. If you look at healthy individuals, they're basically Homer Simpsons. And that's what you want. You don't want a healthy individual with a lot of, I don't mean that personally. I just mean that their T cells are, are basically have not too many functions. Okay? And so, and it turns out, um, and I, I'm not going to go into it too much detail, but this is, this is basically how we're treating this now. So here we have now 20 proteins, once again, single cells. And, um, and you're able to look at uh, uh, which functions are coordinated this way. Um, uh, so here's two functions that are actually anti-correlated. And here's, here's two that are correlated. And it turns out that's actually pretty insightful. So uh, two of the proteins that are measured here, um, TNF-alpha and interferon gamma, are uh, typically measured in these types of trials, um, but not always with single cell resolution, because that's a tough thing to do. And what we found uh, on, the, on the data set that I showed you before is that the production of those two proteins, it turns out, is anti-correlated on this patient, which means that you might have some pretty good T cells, but basically they're either doing one of these important functions or the other. And so they're actually becoming a little bit dysfunctional. And, and this may be a clue as to why these patients are beginning to fail. There may be many other clues. That's why we do a lot of other types of measurements. OK, so I'm going to just conclude here with a, a, a few conclusions. Um, so um, I've tried to give you an idea um, that um, uh, you know, there's technologies coming around that are going to be able to allow us to make highly informative diagnostic measurements for relatively modest price, and, um, uh, and even things as small as one cell, 
And the goal of this is either to dramatically shorten the clinical watch and wait period, so we don't wait 10 weeks before taking a, a terminally ill patient and changing the therapy, but instead we just wait a few days, or, um, or that we um, actually define the therapy regimen by doing continuous feedback with really informative diagnostic measurements. Um, the, um, uh, the dynamics of a patient response to a drug, which is really very fast, is completely incompatible with how we do diagnostics now. But it's not incompatible with some of these simple technologies. And in fact, um, you know, one reason why we want to make these so that disgruntled high school student can do them is so that even the patient can do them. I mean, there's no reason why, this, why we have to travel to the patient's house if we just give them you know, these kind of, 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 of things at home and let them basically phone in the answer. Let them take a role in, in this. Um, uh, uh, and, and to really develop uh, uh, effective personalized medicine is going to require really inexpensive diagnostic technologies. And it's going to require patient participation. And that means it's got to be simple, and it's got to be painless to the patient. And, um, and, and that's what, what we have to and, and then finally, you know, these ways that we measure the proteins right now are done with antibodies. And the reason why we do that is that's the only protein measurement that we can do, that if we do it here in Pasadena or in San Francisco or London or New York, we get the same answer from the same sample. No other way to do that. But it turns out antibodies are in, unstable and they're very, very expensive. And so, and, and it turns out they prevent you from doing some of these types of assays I told you about on a really big scale. And so you need to replace them, I think, with uh, chemically defined ent entities that have the performance of monoclonal antibodies that are just like making a cheap chemical in terms of uh, synthesizing them. And that's, uh, that's something that a, a big chunk of my group works on, um, but I didn't have time to go into it. And here's, um, I show, tried to show people that actually did um, the, the, the bulk of the work throughout the talk, but here's the whole group um, that um, uh, many folks uh, working on this. I want to point out that you know a couple years ago, uh, the Lemelson Caltech Student Prize was launched, and the first two winners of this prize, which is thirty thousand dollars, parties on them, <laughs> came um, from um, uh, first year was Ophir Vermesh, who did the blood chip uh, uh, work on the blood chip along with Rong Fan, and uh, Heather Agnew, who did our alternatives to antibodies, the protein capture agents that I referred to at the very end. But in general. I mean, in Caltech, we get the very best kids here. And, um, and so there's just a bunch of kids that want to go change the world, and, and they're doing it. Um, there's a lot of, you know, you're only as good as your collaborators. We have great collaborators in this work. I mentioned Tony Rebus is running that trial, but there's a lot of theory involved in some of the stuff we do. Rafi Levine, Francois Remarkle, and Bill Goddard. Um, clinicians, Paul Michel, Tim Clousey, um, cancer biologist, Caius Radu, Mike Phelps, Owen Witte. Uh, David Baltimore is involved in this immunotherapy trial. Uh, Barry Sharpless, a Nobel laureate from Scripps, is involved in the Capture Agent project. Um, we have a company that's commercializing some of the stuff I talked about. Um, I have a, a lab in Singapore that also is, is, is working on some of these things. And then, um, you know, everybody says, well, how do you pay for it? You know, by and large, we pay for it from, um, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the, uh, the, there's, a, there's a, a significant amount of money that comes from the National Cancer Institute. I run a cancer center that's localized here but has a clinical aspect at UCLA. Um, but there's, you know, philanthropy is really important. Otherwise, we simply could not do this. And, and Caltech has really superb facilities, as well as we have now a laboratory at, uh, at UCLA in the medical school that's devoted to um, that my, my group, at, um, is basically it's my group's lab. And I'll, and I'll finish with um, just a quote. So this is from my friend Mike Phelps, who his, one of his, he was a great teacher to me and still is, and one of his great teachers was Norton Simon, the Norton Simon Museum fame. And, um, and I'll just read it. So life has a natural curve. You go up, you plateau, and you go down. And the only way to change this is to be continually starting new curves and to remain in a state of becoming. And that's one of the great things about Caltech, that we can always be in a state of becoming. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>